Good morning, all. Thank you for coming out this morning. I'm kind of a dreary day, but uh, we have a terrific speaker. I'm going to say the reason that more people are here is because of a dreary day, not because of our terrific speaker. And so, um, we are, uh, we have our schedule filled. I'm putting more information in. Uh, hopefully this coming week, I will have all the information and I'll send it to our staff here and they can put it on the website so you can see who's speaking, what topic and a description of the topic. Now, next week, um, the next two weeks we're at Ben Abraham, Next week is Franklin Lewis. He's going to talk on the Jewish comedians. And the next week is close to Veterans Day. And Paul Cooper generally speaks. And he's going to speak this time on the birth of the Israeli Air Force. And this topic was um, decided for all of the activity over the Middle East. So he may deviate from that and provide some more insights uh, relative to what's going on. Um, again, Beth Abraham, uh, they raised their cost this year to $8. So we partner with them, we are integrated with them. So if you buy the $65 for the entire session, that only counts here. So if you go over there, it's, it's another $8. Um, Another thing I'd like to um, see if I can emphasize, uh, if there's any questions we want to ask the speakers, I will do my best to move quickly to you, and I would like you to use the microphone, not because you don't think you've got a strong voice, but because it certainly helps people who have a little difficulty in hearing. So let's. Let's be considerate of others and wait for me to get there with the mic. And if there's a lull, I'm sure Donna can fill that space. So that won't be a problem, right, Donna? Okay. Well, even with your bad knee, there. So, so Donna Schlehack has been here many, many times, and we enjoy when she comes. Um, she retired several years ago, and we haven't had her as often, but I think Carol um, enticed her to come this year, and maybe she can entice her in the future also. And so she's going to talk about what's happening in the Middle East. And just a little bio of Donna is, she's the Professor Emerita of Political Science and past chair of the department at Wright State University. She currently serves as president of the WSU Retirees. Is that still true? Past president and is a frequent contributor to radio on 700 WLW. Is that still true? Yes, okay. yesterday. And so her continuing areas of interest include U.S. foreign policy and terrorism. And so I'm sure this is going to be very interesting. So give Donna a nice round of applause. Thank you so much. I'm going to start slow and steady, but um, if I need to perch you, you'll understand. I don't expect the bar will be open, but um, I, I apparently overdone it. There's something called an MCL in my knee. Um, thank you for the introduction, Carol. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have to say that as I began organizing my thoughts, I realized I, I, should, I just should organize this in terms of before October 7 and then after October 7. Uh, so if you will bear with me, that that's how I think I'd like to approach our topic today. Um, foreign policy, leadership, Middle East, terrorism, they have all come home. Every single one has come home to Bruce. And I, I thank you for the opportunity to come today and talk, talk about this subject, where it's going, what we can do, what we should do. Um, I would like to say, since it is an election cycle, and I study foreign policy leadership, uh, how impressed I was by the absolute unequivocal political position President Biden staked out on October 
seven. Clearly, clear line. Uh, you may remember, I, I don't recall such a clear line until we go back to maybe Ronald Reagan and Libya and the line in the sand. You know, if you cross it, you die. It was the Gulf of Sidra. But the unequivocal nature, and in, in, at the time of all of the uncertainty, all of the violence, President Biden made an unequivocal statement with clarity. Uh, and, and we can talk about the consequences of it. Uh, but this is a president already in his first term. The end of the Afghan war, bringing the country through COVID, the economic recovery that's underway, despite everyone's best attempts to, to, to undermine it. I cannot explain why he's not getting more credit and support for what he has done. It is remarkable. And in the context of those actions, clear, decisive, action-based, for a guy who just turned 80, uh, he's accomplished more in this one term, hopefully his first term, uh, than most presidents are able to point to. Well, um, let me say, on the day before October 7, I was thinking about how much I had enjoyed getting my two sisters to go down to the Marimont Theater to see Golda. I don't have to ask for a show of hands. I'm expecting everyone here has seen it. If not, uh, all I can say is you've missed a very good one. If anything, Helen Mirren is in my um, But the focus, if you've not seen it, um, if you have, you know, it was on the, the aftermath of the Omicron War and the investigations that that, that took place. Um, I also think it's, it's, it's worth noting the, the great role played by Lee Schreiber, who was playing Henry Kissinger. Um, but why I mentioned Golda to you is um, in, in, the, in the process of assisting Israel after the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War, uh, it was Henry Kissinger, who's written extensively about this, who advised the IDF, the Israeli government, that after Egyptian and Syrian forces had been pushed back in 1973, uh, and the, the IDF was prepared, had, had encircled it to destroy that third army and all of the tanks of, of the Egyptians in the Sinai. It was Kissinger who made that argument that, that, that only a friend could make, which is at this point, this is when you stay your hand. By not destroying all of those tanks and, and, and the third army of uh, uh, Egypt's uh, military, that's when you lay the groundwork for some reconciliation it would take six years before the Camp David Accords of 1979, but it was the president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, who would sign the Camp David Accords with Menachem Megan. Uh, that's a long time in politics, I know, but Kissinger was right. And he's been, and Henry's still with us, 100 years old, he's been on my mind as I thought about President Biden consulting with, advising the Israeli government how to proceed. In the film, when, when, when you watch Golda, you'll see a point at which Golda Meir asks her military advisors, it seems like they, the Egyptians, they don't know that they won. They don't know when to stop. It, 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 it was just such a, a small but a powerful point in the film. Um, so it's before October 7, I'm thinking of Golda and that, that you know, the role that Kissinger played Israel, our friend with so many parallels to what we're experiencing in our own political domain, the contentious nature of politics. We all identify with it, yes? Uh, the debate of the, the proper role and the distribution of power, the role of religion in our society and religious authorities. The fact that we both have, we had, and perhaps he'll return, but charismatic leaders now facing criminal prosecution for behavior that uh, uh, under most, most laws would be considered corrupt. Uh, the rising threat from Iran, we are seeing both in Israel and here. Uh, and yet something I, I, I wasn't sure how to put on my list, even, even on October 6th, I've been watching the rising incidents of anti-Semitism in our country. 
Uh, I'm sure like many of you, you know, I, I see the ADO newsletters, the Southern Poverty Law Center's data, the FBI's reports as well. All of this preceding October 7th, very disturbing trend when there is white Christian nationalism part of what uh, some people call MAGA. White Christian nationalism. Uh, should we be surprised that it is accompanied by a rise in anti-Semitic behavior? Uh, I, I, I would suggest no. So I, I, it's October 6th, I'm thinking about the, the interesting parallels. And, and then of course we were uh, out of town trying to enjoy some fall leaf colors up in, in Wisconsin when, when the news of October 7th hit. Um, I've, I've been on WLW kind of unpredictably, but Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays, uh, I usually tell my friends it's called Dr. Donna's Fan Club. They're all, I think there's six or seven members of it who like to be notified when I'll be on. Yesterday when I was on at 4.30, I tuned in ahead of time. They were preceded by a conversation about haunted houses in Cincinnati. So it's, it's not like it's an entire foreign policy world affairs afternoon, but they're trying. And my mission on WLW, which has its host of very hard right posts and call-in shows, uh, I like to be the old professor who isn't too terribly boring uh, and would like to get out some accurate information and at least ask people to think about some important questions. And that really is fundamentally what the Biden administration has done with Israel in terms of their job. We know what the heck did we not know. How did this happen? Many of you in this room, uh, I think we always read Foreign Affairs, one of the, the leading foreign policy magazines in the country. It comes out quarterly. Two days before October 7, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, had published a long article about the Middle East and how you know, things were really quieting down. They let him modify the article. Uh, but it still reads like someone uh, in the American establishment intelligence community who was in close touch with IDF and Mossad, et cetera. We did not see it come. Um, Carol probably knows this, you may not, but my real interest in foreign policy is decision making, especially in terms of crisis. So you, you've uh, you, Carol signed me up for this talk. I was in, just in, in, incredibly enticed afterwards to see all of these coming together. Leadership, crisis, decision-making, terrorism. Uh, you know, the, 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 the tension goes up and typically the quality of decision-making goes down. What I found myself saying in the three weeks since that attack, uh, that pretty much the same thing. President Biden's first advice was, Slow down. Slow this freight train down. Let us get more information. We need a lot more information. We can figure out how this happened afterwards, but to slow down the decision making. You can see a few gray hairs here in, in, in the lecture. And I know when I mention the Cuban Missile Crisis, you will all understand what I'm talking about. <clears throat> John Kennedy, so surprised by the presence of not only those artillery sites to defend, but the medium range ballistic missiles that the Soviets were installing in Cuba, near Havana, in, in 1963. So, um, sorry, 62, the Cuban Missile Crisis. What was the first reaction of his intel community? Well, his first reaction was bring my advisors together. We all called that the executive community or the X. Uh, get more information, but his best and closest advisors including Robert Kennedy, was to slow things down. The rush to a solution, probably the use of force, the Pentagon was prepared to completely destroy all of those installations uh, that the Soviets had going in. Uh, but there were voices, particularly the voice of an advisor, Robert Kennedy, that no one could discount. Um, was, you know, he's attorney general at the time. But he was put on the executive committee because he truly was his brother's representative. And when he could speak, uh, they could not ignore the rush to military action in Cuba. Perhaps was the most comparable thing, other than 9 11, that we have seen in our country. Uh, so Biden, slow it down, get more information, 
and think about the day after. What comes after? Uh, that's about the last thing when you are in a crisis. That's about the last type of rational, linear decision-making human beings can make. Uh, and when they are in a collective, like a small executive committee, we see even more tendency toward group. We've all heard of groupthink. Uh, this is when the term actually got coined. Graham Allison, who wrote the great book about the human crisis, and others talk about the way to avoid it. The Kennedy team probably accidentally avoided it, but it is now taught uh, in, in training segments at the Pentagon and elsewhere. What's the first thing you do? Don't rush. You know, you don't immediately rush to the, the first biggest solution that sounds right and everybody can agree. One thing we know about group, it's interesting, is because if it, it's happening in a collective, nobody is individually responsible for the outcome. And they tend to go to more extreme options and solutions of problems when threatened. So I think you're, you're probably seeing my parallel in terms of thinking about how in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv today, you know, people are thinking about how this, this plays out. Um, then came October 7th. I was on the road and far enough, I was practically up at Lake Superior. Let me just say that I know what it's like not to have any cell phone service and, and, and no internet. It is, it, it is still, um, if it's not quite paradise, it is a very unspoiled part of the country. Um, and what I'd like to talk to you about today is kind of what the impact will be in Israel, in the aftermath, on the Saudi ports, uh, regionally, obviously uh, with regard to Iran, uh, but also let's start here. At, I imagine you are all aware of the many demonstrations that have been taking place, not just in Beirut and Cairo. Uh, in you know, Pakistan and in India, but in our own country on campuses. I heard Bronx and Brooklyn over at the, the breakfast table earlier. Uh, big demonstration in, in, in Brooklyn yesterday. I always check Fox News first to see which ones they're, 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 they're covering. It'll almost always give me the most extreme example that I'm looking for. Um, college students. Uh, this morning, the conversation was about Tulane University. Uh, and the, the rising anti-Semitism there on a campus that's more than 40% Jewish students. So you can, you can imagine the discomfort that, that, that this, this is causing as well. Uh, I'd also like to talk about, if we, have, if we have time, about what's happening at the United Nations. Uh, the day after the, I'm sorry, the day of the General Secretary, Secretary General Gutierrez's speech about uh, Israel's ambassador demanded his resignation. So it's, it's going to be, then, then the next day, the UN General Assembly passed its resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire. Okay, so we are, we are on record seeing where all of these players uh, are playing out. So um, let us start then. United States, we're beginning to see the descent, at least on college campuses. Uh, the Writers Guild of America, of all people, uh, did not put out a statement the war broke out. Um, organizations that I think most of us would always have thought likely to be a, a friend of Israel, silent. It's been odd, hasn't it? The, the, the silence. I understand that silence in regard to, for example, the idea of decision to release the graphic nature of the video footage that was shot during the attacks. I have to confess, I have been unable to watch more than sporadic moments of it. It's, it the brutality is, is, is it's beyond my comprehension. I asked myself before coming up to see you, should you not have watched all of it? And I said, my, all I can say for myself is that had it been video footage of the sexual exploitation of a child for the purpose of making pornography, I could not have watched that. I, I could not watch the footage, but I understand why the Israeli government decided to release the footage. Sometimes in this, this 
social media news driven world in which we live, you have to see it. Um, and yet I know, I have complete confidence that the government knew <laughs> part of it would cause the family members of those hostages or the victims in the attacks of October 7th to possibly see the family member <clears throat> killed, abducted, and still is. So the ongoing horror at, at, at the pain. Uh, but if, if the video footage comes up, um, I perhaps you'll have more courage than I did. I simply did not want that in my head permanently as, as this thing unfolds. So here we are. We appear to be on the cusp of what General Petraeus, former head of CIA and head of CENTICOM, said a couple of days ago. We appear to be on the cusp of both terrorism and running urban guerrilla warfare in Gaza for who, who knows how long. Um, I, I probably won't have much to say about the proposed hostage swap that's underway. I, at, at some point, I expect that may happen. I do not think that's going to slow this phase of the ground campaign in which the idea is, is uh, involved. I will say there was an interesting announcement from Washington. Uh, the Pentagon has sent General Glenn, <coughs> forgive me, General Glenn uh, to Israel to consult with them. And if you care about this conflict, General Glenn was in charge in Iraq during the Iraq War when the uh, campaign to eradicate ISIS was underway. So General Glenn knows what that campaign, uh, how it was run, how it had to be run, what the costs and the implications were. Uh, I will remind you that we destroyed Al-Qaeda when we first went into Iraq after 9-11. Carol, I remember sitting at, at, at Wright State in a basketball game night, the, the, the day the war in Iraq started, thinking, I still can't connect the war in Iraq to 9-11. I know, I, I was totally confident from my own research, we were not going to find any nuclear weapons there, but the war had started, Al-Qaeda was destroyed, and of course, out of the detention camps that ran would come ISIS. Uh, and, and so the, the parallels that General Glenn will no doubt be touching on tomorrow in terms of how to proceed differently to try to achieve a better outcome. It's hard. And again, I want to commend uh, Joe Biden for saying we've made some mistakes. I know this is anathema, right? How could an American president think of the man he'll be running against? Can you imagine him ever saying, I made a mistake once? I can't. Uh, but Joe Biden saying we made a mistake after 9 11. We, we, it, it was the wrong call. Uh, Biden voted for it at the time, but has regretted it, and I do believe it very strongly informed his decision to uh, end our military involvement in Afghanistan. I've said to other people, it took two presidents to get us out of Afghanistan. Two. Um, and it will be, I think it's another one of those accomplishments lists um, that when it comes time to put the list of reasons uh, for real election, we, we, we can get to it then. But saying to Israel, slow down, look at the mistakes that we made. If you are going to be confronting protracted guerrilla, uh, urban guerrilla con conflict in Gaza, we will send you the team who've learned the painful lessons here. The equipment needed things to avoid. I don't know if we had anything other than technology that we can offer Israel in terms of locating and rescuing hostages. We have ground penetrating radars that are being used. Every time I open the newspaper, there's another wonderful story about some uh, Guatemalan civilization that's been found under a mile of, of, of jungle and forest, but satellites have identified you know, an, an, an entire city uh, that People suspect it might have been there, but no one could put their hands on it. Will there be bunker buster bombs? How can Israel use one if hostages might? I mean, the, 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 the quandary is awful, and that must be one of the things that's contributing to slowing this.
this down. Let's see here. So, um, and if at any point, because we do have another microphone, if something occurs to you and you have a question or a comment you want, please let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll walk over to you. So, where are we first and before we talk about Israel? Unity government absolutely makes, makes perfect sense at this time. Although one of the things I love about Israeli culture and politics is that people can still, even in the toughest moments, disagree. Uh, and, and, and perhaps that is something that we as Americans should figure out how to do as well, to disagree. Sometimes disagreeably, I, I grant you. Uh, but we seem to be at a point in our country where if you disagree, then I have to demonize you. Right? That's, you know, we, we, we cannot possibly disagree. There could not possibly be any common ground. Um, so, so, so therefore, um, compromise is bad, and, 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 and here we are. I've, I'm very confident about the aid package that will go through the Senate very quickly. It will probably be delivered to the House as a package. Uh, there is really not time to pull that package apart and debate it and, and negotiate it. Uh, our new Speaker of the House is going to be given a fake that. Here comes the aid package for Israel. Here comes the package for Ukraine. And they, I think they are going to have to take one big pill swallow it at a time. Uh, from a military resupply picture, it makes no sense not, not, not to do them both at the same time. The, um, the divisions in Congress are, well, let, let's come back to that and talk about where the Israeli government is right. Uh, when Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke yesterday, many of you, you may have heard those comments. He basically said the next stage of the ground campaign in Gaza uh, is, is, is our goal to eliminate Hamas um, and to rescue the hostages. So he did not seem to treat them as mutually exclusive, that both were going to be pursued at the same time. But in the Israeli press, I think there's not a lot of confidence that that if the network is as big as we've been told, the hostages have probably been scattered throughout. A good portion of the Hamas leadership is out of the country already. But CIA says there are between 25 and 30,000 Hamas fighters on Twitter in, 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 in Gaza. So when President, Prime Minister Netanyahu says this is going to be a long project, that's one of the reasons why. Uh, General David Petraeus made an interesting comment. He said this could be like the campaign that Stalin grew in 1944-45 for the World War II uh, and, and, and the history buffs here. But Stalingrad had been pretty much the you know, civilian population was gone. Petraeus has a new book out on the nature of war, so he, he, he's shown up on all of the talk shows. I don't think we have, we have I don't think we have a, a real comparable case to try to study what the idea is hoping to accomplish. Heavily populated, well-armed, underground, holding hostages. I, if I had to create a more complex and difficult scenario, I'm not sure I could. Um, I do ask the question, if Hamas is clever enough to help create this type of a scenario, uh, why can they not do a little more creative thinking as well? But we'll come back to that at, at the end of the comments. In 1988, Carol, shortly after I started at Wright State, the Dayton Council on World Affairs and the Dayton Business Community had a guest speaker from Saudi Arabia who heard the name of Prince Bamba. Whenever there was something new and sexy to fly at Wright Patterson Air Force Base or any other base, he would show up and, 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 and want to be able to fly that aircraft. And I was a young professor, but I got to ask a question. So I asked him, given the great wealth of your country, when do we see the influence? When do we see the exercise of that influence? Uh, when, when will there be leadership on the part of Saudi Arabia and the region? Um, I think about it now because Prince Salman, who has been, he's been negotiating <coughs> uh, a pact with Israel, he has, uh, in the last 72 hours, made more references to the Palestinians than we have heard uh, initially. 
But I ask you to think about his own problem. Iran is exploiting the situation to suppress domestic dissent. So are the Saudis. So is almost every authoritarian Arab leader in the region. The last thing they want to do is see a great big demonstration in favor of the Palestinians. Because, oh my God, at some point, people might actually want some, you know, might actually want some say over their own government. It's a very tricky road for the people we might be looking to, the Saudis in this case, to be able to show some leadership, say that yes, we want the normalization pact with Israel, and it needs to have that clearly defined component in terms of Palestinians, unlike what happened in 1979 in the Camp David Awards. Uh, if you talk to Palestinians, that's probably the model that they're thinking about. They make a separate piece, they say and we we're on the to-do next list, and then nothing happens. Now, of course, we have to note the Palestinian leadership itself, deeply divided, considered corrupt by many in the West Bank, pretty disconnected to the Palestinian population in Gaza as well. They, they've been there since 2007 without a vote. So nobody has recently decided or voted for Hamas as the representative of the Palestinian people in Gaza. But Arab states, the more authoritarian Arab states, are deeply concerned about these demonstrations. Uh, the Arab Spring of 2011 got out of control very quickly, spread across the region, brought down governments. Uh, it, it led to that civil war in Syria, which is one of the reasons why in addition to the Iraq war, we still have U.S. service people stationed in both Iraq and Syria. Uh, yes, uh, the, the complexities and the interconnections are, are almost endless. But the leadership, Joe Biden's leadership, Saudi leadership, where is it? Salman has been making the gestures, wants to continue, although he's, he's obviously temporarily suspended any talk on, on the normalization of relations with Israel. Moving the, the Abraham Accords forward, it's been interesting to me to watch how Joe Biden will pick and choose, whether it's Afghanistan or the Abraham Accords, if it looked good, if it served American national interests, helped our friends. So he's moving forward on both the Abraham Accords, moved forward on Trump's proposal to get out of Afghanistan. Um, this, is, this is truly a leader. You know, he sees the next, the next, and the next step. And he makes the hard decisions. Okay, uh, the regional demonstrations here in the United States. Um, any of us who grew up on a college campus are not terribly surprised by the somewhat underinformed, naive college age demonstra demonstrations that have been happening. Um, but it strikes me, even on college campuses, how much they have lacked. Uh, and when I ran the Model UN program, we were doing, uh, we, we had conversations about Middle East politics, coalitions, constantly. Uh, but because the students were not representing the United States, they were representing a whole. They, they, they could take an argument, uh, pro-Israel, pro-Palestinian, back and forth, get, get some facts. There was real civil discourse based on facts. I know it's I'm, I'm an old-fashioned professor. Uh, I look at the college students on these demonstrations today, and I wonder how much real fact-filled, historically-based, critical conversation have they had uh, before they get out and they put the kaffee over their face at their demonstration. It's Maybe it's a rite of passage on college campuses still, but um, the, the naivete of the demonstrations has has really struck me so far, at least at this point. So um, we are opening a period of protracted guerrilla conflict. Um, the United States, as I know all of you, we have a, a carrier battle group in the Persian Gulf, a carrier battle group plus two more uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, special forces and the hostage rescue teams that have long since been dispatched are consulting with our, uh, our, our friends in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. Um, what do we do now to help Israel? 
what's the most important thing the United States and Americans can do right now to help us? I didn't see a single hand go up. Yes, it, 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 um, it's doing exactly what we're doing right now, which is talking about the situation, uh, perhaps feeding back to our elected officials. I suspect that anybody who works in the House of Representatives has a much, much uh, shorter agenda. But uh, the decline in public support for Israel really disturbs me. I mean, on college campuses, anti-Semitism rising. Um, and I guess that's why President Biden's decision to be unequivocal in his de declaration, this is where we are, this is what we're going to do, um, and you know, to, to set the parameters of that conversation, I say thank you, Joe Biden. Uh, it doesn't mean there won't be a continuing conversation. I see a lot of confusion on the media. Uh, you know, the, 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 the speakers, uh, they're, they're desperate for news when the internet blackout happened in Gaza the other night. They, 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 they literally were, were I mean, how are we going to get the story out? How will they get pictures? And if somebody has a camera phone in Gaza and something happens, how will they send it out? Um, very short term. And I do want to say to you, well, one thing we can do is not be short term in our reaction to the news that just batters us every time it comes out. You know, another hostage dead, um, the civilian casualties. What we have to try to do is focus on long term. Uh, so slowing it down, focusing on the long term. Uh, what will that mean? Well, um, President Biden, in his first address and in almost every press conference since then, has said, and it's not the perfect solution, it's not a complete solution, but he has added back to the conversation. Where do we go next? There has to be a two-state solution without particular details. But uh, because that had been, shall we say, removed from the political conversation pretty much since then, Prime Minister Benyamin came back into power. It's like, well, it's poo poo. There can't be a two state solution. People write it off without suggesting what comes next. So that, that's how I fault them the most. You can reject it. Tell me what your alternative is. Uh, and uh, as the United States has objected to the slow expansion of settlements uh, in, in, in the West Bank, we, we have this conversation back and forth, but not a single real alternative to a two-state solution. I'd be delighted to discuss alternatives to it, but failing that, I suspect this is where American conversation is going to go. Uh, will there be a team dispatched? Might the Saudis step forward and actually show some leadership at this point in time? The, the, um, the, the financing that's going to be I bet the significant expatriate Palestinian worker population, now second and third generations of some, some cases of Palestinian workers in Saudi, in the Emirates, in Bahrain, et cetera. There is a, there is a cohort there of the means to act. And it strikes me that a crown prince who describes Saudi Arabia as the keeper of the holy sites of Islam he has a built-in claim to talk about uh, you know, Jerusalem. He has a built-in obligation to do that. Uh, but the Saudis, particularly under Prince Salman, have been much more interested in getting their economy ready to go to a post-petroleum economy. Uh, they, you, know, you can now go to a mixed-gender movie theater in Saudi Arabia. Isn't it wonderful? Uh, but a lot of the other freedoms, the liberties that you and I take for granted, uh, which people might start discussing if they have a lot of public gatherings, most of which will probably you know, be prohibited. Um, can, you know, it is superficial across the economy, high tech. I think the attraction of uh, a treaty with Israel, a friendship with Israel, if only based upon their mutual fear and distrust of Israel. And Saudi's desire to tap into that cohort of high technology. You know, whether it is desalinization, what, whatever it might be, this crown prince, he's, he's, he's a millennial. 
he sees that next phase of the economy happening. He knows that most of his young Saudi cohorts know what life is like outside the kingdom, uh, and they want change. They're getting change. They're getting it quickly in terms of gender. Women are now allowed to drive. Isn't it wonderful? Uh, I mean, you, you pick your one little thing that you want in there. But there are still a lot of women in prison in Saudi Arabia for protesting for women's rights. So there is there, there's hardly a system there that, that, that enables that, that, that sort of effort, a progressive effort to modify the government. Top down win. But Salman, I would suggest to you, is now seeing that opportunity to, uh, based upon his religious obligations, to include that Palestinian component, not just the humanitarian language that we're hearing today, but something longer term, post-conflict, post the surge of humanitarian aid. What then? How do you, even if you have, and I'm not sure how they're going to measure the end of Hamas, how do you make sure the next generation doesn't appear? As Americans, we saw ISIS almost immediately on the heels of Al-Qaeda, once it was shut down in, in, in Iraq. In fact, we now understand that we contributed to the rise of ISIS in its large numbers because of putting 10, 20, 30, 50,000 young men in detention camps. Not a good idea. I'm sure General Glenn, Glenn is, is saying that's the sort of mistake. They had no economy in which to participate, meaning they could never marry, have a family, you know, buy a car, learn from our mistakes. This is what families do for each other. Isn't it? This is what friends do for each other. We Situations are not identical, but we made some real mistakes we want you to avoid. And the rise of ISIS was one of them. Uh, and I, I'm absolutely confident that however Hamas is put out of business needs to, in the plan, include how do we engage all of that talent, all of those young men? When I looked at the, you know, the, the some of the young men on, on, on the footage, they're 20s, you know, they're young, they're strong. Give them a productive place to engage their energies other than Hamas. Where could you go to get a paid job even if the stipend is pretty low in Gaza? Hamas. 50% young person unemployment. I mean, it's you, you see what it is an equation. I don't know how many lessons we learned after ISIS, but. So that's where I am in my thinking. After the ground operation, whatever getting rid of Hamas means, most of the leadership is out of the country anyway, so we're talking most of the fighters. Um, what then? And that is, that is where probably more than the UN at this point, uh, a Saudi, UAE, Bahraini, a coalition of very wealthy states that would really like to squeeze out the Shiite influence of Iran. Most of the Palestinians are Sunni, uh, and yet they get most of their money, their assistance from Iran, which is a Shiite state. Yes, it isn't it odd? Uh, at least in Lebanon, we can understand why Shiite groups, because Allah, have a connection to Iran. But why the Sunni population? Well, because the resources are there. Um, what comes after? How do you not repeat? It's, it's, it's the most awful um, cycle of self-repeating, self-reinforcing violence. How do you find another direction for that talent? I'm not sure about the leadership yet, but when properly engaged, and I will give you one example where we have seen this actually happen in a country torn by hundreds of years of national struggle, terrorist groups, and urban guerrilla warfare, and that would be in Ireland particularly in Northern Ireland, which uh, was British occupied. Uh, and from about the 50s up until the Good Friday events, I got lucky. I, I was in New York at a UN conference the day the, the Northern Irish Peace Accords were, the Good Friday Accords were signed. How do you make that change so they don't have the Hamas to go join? How do you do it? Well, fortunately for the people of Ireland, the answer had to do with EU pumping money into Ireland, both Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And by the time the Good Friday Accords were signed in 1998, uh, the 
average income of an Irish citizen was equivalent to that of an English citizen. The investments by the EU, some industrial, but also in tourism, uh, small farms that were failing, sending all the young folks off to the cities. The Irish were so smart, they took the EU money, they kept the farms, they created b and bs If you haven't done a b and b tour of Ireland, it needs to be on your bucket list. But by building up the economy, take, putting people into gainful employment, uh, both the Protestants and the Catholics involved in the armed struggle in Northern Ireland. And I'd like to point out as well, the voice of women, Cap mothers, Catholic mothers, Protestants, in the conversation in Northern Ireland especially, they were voices very early for peace. But it was when the economies began improving, uh, and it became more and more costly, recruitment became harder and harder. Uh, and when we had an American president, Bill Clinton, and a British prime minister, Tony Blair, who would collaborate with the players in Northern Ireland, we got a piece of it. Has it been perfect? No. Has there been violence? Yes. Uh, they, uh, the British had just decided to terminate the end of all the inquests in Northern Ireland. There were a lot of murders and deaths and bombings still unsolved, um, but they, they move forward. To me, the argument would be we need to gainfully engage this population in an economy building, typically in the 21st century in which we live. That means you are building an economy within a state within a state infrastructure, which is why that, that whatever that Palestinian organization is going to look like, that's what it should hold. And will, of course, contain their national aspirations. That's wonderful. But build your country rather than bombing someone else's. Uh, people need to see some clear alternatives before them. It's happened in our life. Uh, now, I recognize that Israel uh, the, and, and Palestine's conflict goes back a few more millennia, uh, but, but nonetheless, there we have examples in place where you can build peace. You, you may not get there right away, but you can build peace. And looking at that organization of Hamas with its external funding, its ability to recruit internally, the fact that what within the past 36 hours they again tried to land a small naval operation on Israeli beach. I mean, they, they, they clearly are committed to this cause and these needs. We need to put some alternatives in front of them. And I'd suggest to you, who better to make those investments than someplace, perhaps, you know, coming from Riyadh or Mecca. Uh, you know, there are so many regional states with the means to do it. Uh, and, and with their own indigenous domestic situations where they really don't want to see the demonstrations. They're worried that once, as, as we say in the states, once you vote, you keep voting. Well, in non-democratic states, once you protest, once you resist, you tend to keep resisting. So Salman strikes me as in between the Abraham Accords and now this opportunity to want to move his country forward in a way, not at odds with, but literally in tandem with Israel, makes perfect sense. It would deny Iran a real opportunity to cause trouble. Uh, this does not solve the Lebanese issue. Um, and Le Lebanon, my, my heart aches. My old professor, I had done a lot of his field work in Lebanon. Every time we hear a lecture on Lebanon, at some point you have to stop and nearly weep uh, at, at, at what happened to that country they used to call the Paris of, of the Mediterranean. Uh, let me share some of the questions I'm thinking about. And um, then we, we get to hear some of yours as well. I hope. Uh, Hamas is a political organization. Its membership is members mostly Sunni. Uh, its support is mostly Shia. Um, but it is fundamentally a religious organization as well. What does it offer? Jobs, martyrdom, armed struggle. Um, but what do you offer a young man somewhere between, say, 16 and 36? If you can't have a job, you can't own a home, can't marry, have a family, you, you see the problem. So this, this argument that we learned from Northern Ireland would be, 
put a few more alternatives on that agenda. Uh, for Israel, how do you match your military capability with this threat? Uh, particularly if we're looking at a long-term urban guerrilla warfare setting. Israel has not waged one of those. Uh, some of the operations into Beirut and southern Lebanon, but very temporary. They were never present in really large numbers uh, with a, a large civilian population as well. In political science, we often say that uh, whatever your most powerful foreign policy resource is, that's what you want to use first. And if you have an incredibly effective military, that's the first place you go. But I think in the last two and a half, three weeks, what we've seen is IDF and politicians in Israel saying, do we have the means to really achieve this inside the boundaries and costs that we're going to pay in terms of both Israeli lives and civilian lives? Uh, and if not, what do we need to make it happen? Uh, I really commend the Israeli population, conversation, dialogue, differences of opinion, uh, and yet still a solidarity. And I guess that's what bothers me so much about American public opinion at this point. I, too, expected more solidarity with Israel. Um, and we will have time after this crisis to tease out why that happened. Um, I think we've seen signs, worrisome signs, worrisome signs of it earlier as well. Um, so Israel, how does Israel align its political objective uh, and does it have the military means to do that? Does the population, is the population prepared to endure the costs of urban guerrilla warfare? Uh, in the United States, the, the biggest casualties that we took were in Fallujah and Mosul, where it was urban guerrilla combat. Uh, and that is where the vast majority of the, you know, the, the about 3,000 American soldiers were killed but there is a staggering number of them who sustain injuries. In World War II, the soldiers would never have left the battlefield alive. But they're with us now, and they, they represent a, a, a staggeringly large number of people who are completely dependent, completely unable to operate. Uh, first, about the first six months after the Iraq War started, I remember asking a nurse who'd come through uh, for the political background training. I said, well, have you been on the battlefield? She said, yes. Said, well, what's, what's the most troubling, difficult part? She said, oh, by far and away, it's the closed head injuries. That's what they were calling them at the time, the concussions, the brain damage. Uh, the soldiers survive, they can be treated, but we know so little about the brain. I'm not sure why we left the brain to last. We apparently had left the brain to last study. Uh, but even then, 2004, 2005, Soldiers coming home, in some cases, with injuries, we didn't even know what the implications of brain injuries that that, that severe would be, um, and our obligation to care for them. How much of Israel's IDF do you want exposed to that sort of trauma? And then, of course, in terms of PTSD, it is the violence on the battlefield. Whatever your mission is on that battlefield, it is the violence in which you're engaged that has that lingering traumatic effect on so many soldiers. Um, the, 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 the human costs continue. So a um, couple of things before we open the floor to your questions. Uh, in 2017, the Trump administration was able to declare ISIS was, was ended. I have some bad news. ISIS is not ended. Um, and and, and it's, it, can, it continues to carry out some operations. The, is, uh, the Iranian who, from the Islamic Republican Guard, who was the big purveyor of assistance to guerrilla organizations, Mr. Suleimani, was assassinated. Uh, so that part of Iran's operation to try to support guerrillas in Yemen and struggling against the Saudis uh, in Lebanon, in, uh, in, in Gaza as well. Um, and then in 2020, of course, the Trump administration brings us the Abraham Accords. I remember looking at it from the beginning. It, uh, I mean, I, I can see how Jerry Kushner could, could think that this was, and it's a step. 
It's a step in the right direction, economic bonding and political science. We've said this for decades now. That's one way to get people working together. It's one of the reasons why in Northern Ireland they did they wanted that border wall to come down. Uh, and they, they, they don't want it to go back up. Israel will have the same conversation again, I'm sure, whether it's West Bank fencing or in Gaza, if you want a big economic boom, you want people moving, resources moving, goods and services moving across these borders, make them as invisible as, as, as possible. Of course, we're talking 10, 20 years down the road, but bottom line, my point to you today is if we don't fix our eye on where we left being five or 10 years, how do we ever expect to get our way through the incursion that is now underway in Gaza. Uh, that gives hope, at least gives some guidance. It gives an alternative, both to leaders and to members of these organizations. If you want to get things to move in a different direction with different means. Great. Finally, I don't think you want the language of uh, issue one and two. I don't know how I got up here with my sample ballots, <laughs> but I did, but that's okay. There we go. Um, what's going to happen in the meantime? Uh, the proxy attacks will certainly continue. I was, I have been shocked not to see the price of gasoline prime climbing. I mean, we've all been watching it. It has not come. And, uh, I was troubled and you know, a little more nervous when I saw that the Eisenhower had entered the Persian Gulf. Because if we're going to have to punish Iran for something, it will be in, in some of their major oil facilities near Basra or elsewhere on the coast. And you know what happens. People start bidding up the price of oil. Americans start having to have a full tank of gas all the time. And lo and behold, just like 1974, after the Yom Kippur War, we have another energy crisis, uh, oil and gasoline crisis. Uh, another last thing we need as this economy is trying to recover from COVID. Uh, but when, when I'm on WLW, they want to know, well, how does it affect me? Joe here in, you know, in Walnut Hill in Cincinnati, how it affects you is through your economy, through gasoline prices, and if you are family member of somebody who happens to be deployed in the area, uh, it's going to affect you immediately and intensely. And the fact that it hasn't happened, even though we have emptied a good portion of our strategic petroleum reserves already, so it's not like the Biden team is pumping lots of oil out there to keep the price down. That is definitely not the case. But there is this hold constant, don't panic, and I'd suggest to you in very large part because of the steady leadership of the United States. Conversation at the UN has been ugly and divisive on college campuses and elsewhere, we, we, we see that. But the United States is right now that steady force through this process by Israel and always asking that question, where do we want to be next? And please tell me about that. The movie, remember the day after, what's the end of the world movie, but where do you want Israel to be? Living in peace with its neighbors, having addressed some of these underlying grievances, building things together. Um, I would suggest that's where friends of Israel would like to be. I think that is a goal that the American public can support. I understand it's much too early for President Biden or any other negotiators to be thinking about it, but with among the friends of Israel, I say it to you, that's where I, 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 in my heart, I am. How do we get there as Americans who are leading something a little bit better? Americans did it for the people of Northern Ireland. We did it for the people of Bosnia. If you've been to Bosnia and Herzegovina, if you've been down to Srebrenica or other towns, you know, there's still fresh, recent memory of in this case, Orthodox, on Muslim, and Catholics. I mean, the, the brutality of it. 8,000 bodies in, in, in one grave of just young men. And, and young men and, and adult men. Uh, memories are still alive. They are rebuilding an economy. It is not the shining star of the European Balkan area, I can guarantee you, because so many issues remain unresolved. 
Right now, Serbs are more interested in Kosovo than Bosnia and Herzegovina. But they have that three way the Muslim, Christian, uh, split among Catholics and, and Orthodox, all the Catholics. And yet, they all come from exactly the same people. Uh, at least the violence has been stopped. And the EU does for them what it's tried to do in Ireland as well provide the means. If we can't build in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we can at least provide work permits. And the fact that the uh, Netanyahu government was issuing tens of thousands of work permits to young Gaza men, for the most part, before this all started, said, just as we had a labor shortage, uh, Israel knows how to focus a lot of that labor uh, in, in a productive way. So uh, President Biden, uh, I'm not on his campaign team, but when I study leadership, when I study it in crisis, it is as though Joe Biden has read the text for you. Be clear, be firm, have all of your ducks in a row, your national security advisor, uh, secretary of defense, Austin, secretary of, of state, Lincoln, all of them in Israel within what, uh, a day and a half. The consistency, the predictability at a time of crisis, and then offering that voice of, let us share with you what happens in that rush after the attack, whether it's the Cuban missiles being discovered or our 9-11 attack. You're not at your most rational when you're that full of adrenaline. I've learned this, whether it's in a car wreck uh, or whether it's in a family crisis. So I suggest to you, not knowing how this ends, but I suggest to you, this is going to be a chapter in US-Israeli foreign policy and influence. It has the leadership, it has the resources. Does it have the vision, though, to get us past this period of violence and engagement? But now is when we have to write the plan for Africa. Do we have a hand for it, Tom? I saw Microphone? I'm ready. Uh, you're, you're ready? Mic this microphone is ready to try. Uh, so um, we're on pause right now. It's almost as though you feel government's holding their hand. I have to yeah, Car Carol has a list of questions. Oh, um, okay. I'm gonna put my foot up here. There we go. Um, I've been jotting notes as she's talking. I am so sorry. I still miss the, I still miss your Lee. Lee. He always would hit me with the best, most incisive, intel-driven question. So in his memory, it's not quite that decisive. I do have, uh, as with my the last one that came up in my mind here is the total economy and improving economy, how you work across it. From what my limited point of view, it was all the Israeli young men and women pulled into the young forces. The economy of Israel has to be faltering significantly. So, how are they? How is Israel supplying its needs to its people, keeping that up, at the same time keeping the militarily uh, military supply? So that is a complication. As I, the other part is, I thought of the Marshall Plan. Now, the United States after World War II, it built up our enemies with the beyond comprehension, which is essentially what your suggestion is that somehow there needs to be uh, not only Israeli, but unanimity in the Arab world at some point saying it's our responsibility to help our fellow Muslims get back on their feet. If only taking the Absorbing some. My problem with the young people now, and I'm sorry, I go on and on, is maybe they don't have the memory of what happened in World War II. What happened at the when Israel was declared a state and the Arab countries emptied their countries of the Jews. And where did the Jews go? They went to Israel. When the, Israel, when the Arabs left Israel, either on their own or being forced out, whatever it was, 
the Arab countries did not absorb those people the way Israel absorbed its people. Where is this history in the minds of the young people? Because they don't remember that. And my own children don't remember that, and they're not all that young. How do we get it all put together and in good conscience want to help those who have, have and are out to eliminate us? Is that five? I was making notes. Uh, you're right, Carol. After World War II, someone may, I challenge you to name the historical parallel to rebuilding Germany and Germany. Mm -hmm. what, what, what victor does that? I mean, if, if you can think of an historical parallel and it did not permanently end conflict in Europe, thank you, Vladimir Putin. Uh, but it is, they are now two of the linchpins in a European and uh, an Asian, Asia Pacific alliance network, which both in terms of economics, Carol, and in terms of security. That's the missing piece here. There's not a big economic framework. Uh, that's what obviously the Abraham Accords was moving toward, to integrate Israel more into the regional economy. But a regional economy, in Europe, we got the EU and we got NATO. And what has happened in Europe? Recovery, vibrant growth. I mean, it is now, Americans think we have an immigration problem. I mean, it, 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 I mean, they are drawn literally from the Middle East and from Africa to Europe every day because of the economic engine that's put in place because of two things, an economic an EU and because of political and military security brought to them. And they've all been reminded of it with the attack on Ukraine right next door. Uh, President Biden's team has been extremely busy activating those alliance networks in the Asia Pacific region. It's why the Chinese are so deeply hurt uh, and are flying the dangerous aircraft missions against you know, US, US aircraft patrolling in international waters. But interesting, um, while the Trump administration gave us Abraham Accords, it may fall to Biden to say, not only will we need a reconstruction to rebuild just as Europe is rebuilt, but what about a political security arrangement for the region? So it's not just Israel, it is every state in the region concerned about its security, uh, whether it's guerrillas, terrorists, uh, lack of water, climate change, the infrastructure for a security treaty apparatus that would integrate Israel like all other states, and perhaps someday would do that with Palestinians to, to, to establish what? We have collective interests. We need collective solutions. We will enjoy collective security. And in that, in, in that arena, we can create prosperity. I mean, that's what the Europeans did. Post-war Germany, post-war Japan. Um, the Japanese ended up receiving far fewer resources than the Europeans. Some might say racism. Others might say, yes, but you got the Korean War with all of the procurement which happened, which then just put all kinds of stimulus back into Japan. That's when on the motors, for example, switched from just making motorcycles to cars. Uh, and it, they pumped pump the resources in the U.S. bases there as well. Um, I hadn't thought of a parallel from Afghanistan. You know, we needed Trump and Biden to terminate that. But this may be part of a broader solution for Israel. Um, and to, to put it in the context of the region, uh, the movement of peoples across borders, the movement of money, goods, and services, to make it happen, there has to be security. And this, uh, the, Euro the Europeans have just now come up with a, a, an interesting solution to their immigration problem. Trying to talk to the states which have the worst problems, Italy, for example, and Greece. Uh, they're going to identify how many immigrants you got and resources are going to be provided to house them, document them, train them if necessary, and then let them migrate elsewhere because Europe has a labor shortage. Uh, it's gonna be about $20,000 ahead initially in the first year 
uh, that the EU is going to pay these countries that have an immigration problem. So unlike Texas, they don't have to put you on a bus and send you up to New York, which is, uh, that's an attention-getting device, right? And it's quite inhumane. And you know, there, there, were, there were children on some of those bus rides as well. It was just a ridiculous demonstration. Also, an attention-getting device, a call for attention. But Carol, you're, I think you're parallel to the end of World War II. We're in the middle of, of, of the beginning of the Cold War. How do we do the humane thing, help them rebuild, and make it more secure, and maybe for the first time, not lay the groundwork in Europe for the next war? World War I ended with a decision. Um, the French wanted to punish Germany. The American president wanted to say, no, we need to rebuild our enemy. The Brits weren't sure, but they sided with the French, which is why we got the punitive peace imposed on Germany after World War I. Stripped them of their colonies, occupied the Ruhr, um, and then imposed terrible penalties. They had to pay reparations for war damages. They had no money coming in, right? The economy, the industry is burned down. The colonies have been stripped away. There's, what, what do you do? Well, you, you print money, of course. That, 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 that's what any smart government would put. And so, of course, it produces the circumstances that will give us an adult. He didn't, he, I mean, he exploited them brilliantly. He didn't create them. He didn't create the anti-Semitism that, that he drew on in, in his ideology. He exploited them all. Uh, to learn from those mistakes and to offer them up to a friend for a vision, it might be five, 10, 20 years. Carol and I worked on universities. We know we, we, we sometimes write a 20 year plan and we kind of go wink, wink. But you need to think through that exercise, right? But to, to, to rebuild your enemy and to make him your friend, it's a model worth thinking about. Your comment about why Americans are so a historic, Carol. It's the bane of my existence. Every, I think every teacher, every professor wants more history taught in a way that students are owning it. Uh, so if there is a particular story, you know, if it is uh, indigenous peoples, if it is, you know, uh, what, what's happening in Asia or Africa, let them get their arms around it. That was why as a faculty member, I love running our model UN program because for six months, students would get out of their role. They weren't going to be Americans. They were going to be, and we did so many countries. Uh, in fact, some of my notepads, they make them every year from the Islamic Republic of, of Iran, just because they were identified. They would go to the mission. They would research the history, the policy, the problems, the attitudes. And when you get out of your own American perspective, uh, we are not served by not having a lot of, you know, if, if you've lived in Europe and traveled to the Middle East, people are in different countries, speak different languages and knowledgeable of history. Carol, I don't know why our culture de-emphasizes it so much, except I guess I could quote Henry Kissinger again. He has an answer. He was one of the subjects of my dissertation. He has an answer for, for most things. And Kissinger would say it's because in the case of Europeans, Europeans believe in history. Americans believe in progress, which I think is true, but how do you get progress if you don't know what mistakes you've made, what successes you've made, et cetera? But that was, that, that's a Kissingerism that I used a lot. And I think even in terms of rebuilding Germany and Japan, the model is there. It sticks out in history as being so original and uh, so distinctly American and look at Look at the benefit that it's brought us. How, how do we get there? I don't know. But the next presidential election will probably have a big impact on that answer. All right. I kind of going back to the short term to our campuses to the daily barrage of. Anti-Semitism. Do you have sympathy for the Palestinian people? But the propaganda there is so pervasive. What can we do in the in the short term? Because that's really an influencer. It's a strong influence. 
Thank you for that question. The obscenity of what we see on social media now. I mean, I, it's, it's pornographic, it's obscene. I don't, I don't have a word strong enough for it. Uh, but to come back to your question, I was a first year college student living in Antwerp in 1972 when Palestinians and Germans took the hostages on the Olympics. Come out. And um, I remember writing some articles for my high school newspaper about you know, Bangladesh and this and that. Never, never a word about the Palestinians. I mean, this is the outside Cincinnati and had not crept into my, my world. So my education about Palestinians started, uh, literally we got to the German border, we were going to the Olympic games and we were told to go back where you came from. Uh, Germany's closed and it's like, you're okay. And the guard said, turn around, you turn on BBC and you find out what's going on. And uh, so I started at the point and I'm, I recall every time this happens where there's a whole shooting, video footage comes out from the keyboard side. Etc. How? Why would they? Why? Why would people be so brutal? How, how can humans be so inhumane? But I started asking that question and, and, and trying to read a little more history at the time. Um, and if you, uh, if someone like me who sees a big chunk of, of Europe and the Middle East in, in, in foreign policy, just the persistent issues. Uh, it, it, it was very abrupt for me. Uh, the brutality at the time, uh, and of course there wasn't social media, you know, 1972, no internet, no social media. <laughs> Life was so much simpler then. Um, but that was my first opportunity uh, with, with other college students to, to find out why would they do this? How could, how, how could this happen? Um, and Know, what 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 can we do about it? Uh, I was also interested in the time. What does a, a, a want to be democratic state? You know, the, the German response was so utterly, deeply, uh, totally inadequate. Um, and what the Germans still struggle with: far right and far left in their own politics, and how a far left would make common cause with the Palestinians at the time. That's your cause at the Olympic. Well. Uh, so I, I identify with those college students who have no context. I'm, I'm not proud to say they don't have the historical context. They should. Um, and you know, if you're paying your taxes and you, you may do military service and you want to have a family in this country, you should know. The founders were right. We really need well-informed citizens for a democracy to work. But being on a college campus for all of those years, uh, in 19, let's see, uh, 83, when the Marine Barracks was blown up, uh, I was a grad student and my brother was on active duty. And he was uh, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and they were called up to Beirut. And uh, I only learned 10 years after the fact that my little brother came home with bullet holes in every single flight suit that he had. He didn't tell his mother to me that at the time. Uh, it just, you know, it, it finally brought it home. But I spent most of my time as a grad student starting to think about these questions in terms of a, of a foreign policy challenge. If you're a leading great power and you want it to be a safer world, uh, these are the issues that, that, that need to come to the forefront. It, it strikes me that there are a lot of teachers in the room. You know, the, the thing that we're studying with in terms of psychology is the other, right? To come back to anti-self how we define who we are, and that would mean who we do. And it's, it's, it's those conversations, uh, it, it's one of the reasons why people who argued for integration of schools was arguing, just, just for that very thing. I, mean, I, I was so impressed that the Speaker of the House has adopted and raised a, you know, a, a young African-American boy. So he now knows everything about race relations in the United States. <laughs> maybe, maybe he knows a few things. Um, um. But in, in terms of how we interact with the other and how we define who is the other, uh, what frightens me is that the rise of anti-Semitism way preceded what we're currently seeing. And I link it to the rise of white Christian nationalism. Um, 
it is not that very far removed from Nazi ideology. Mm -hmm. um, and it, all of my historian friends will periodic write me or call me and remind me of you know, Hitler, for example, charismatic, tapping into deep roots of, in this case, anti-Semitism, et cetera. Didn't invent any of it, but he exploited it. And there was, there was never a conversation until well after the fact in, in Germany about what to do about that. You know, Germans have worked on owning what happened, have worked on a relationship with Israel, um, they, 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 and they continue to work on it. And they've admitted their own problems, particularly their own security and military apparatuses about neo-Nazis. And it's, it's a real struggle. We as Americans are gonna watch our own Department of Defense. Uh, Lloyd Austin has basically told people if you're on active duty, that your social media activity is, is, is part of your public facing. And uh, the implication here is if you support a group that is racist, anti-Semitic, et cetera, uh, it's gonna be grounds for you. So you, you have to leave from the top on that. But the, the roots of anti-Semitism run so deep. Uh, I, I remember showing Wright State students a picture of the 1920s women's KKK rally. There they are. Oh, yeah, here they, there they are. The cross is burning. The women are in the white robes. Many, many are holding children and their babies in their arms. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they nearly, they, they have big impact on, on, on political elections and, and, and also prohibition at the time. But the roots from, I mean, the, the Klan was formed what? Anti-Jewish, anti they added anti-communism after World War II. But the roots run really deep, and they are so uncomfortable to talk about. So when, when the issue would come up in my classrooms, uh, it, it takes a whole lot of backtracking and you know, talking about issues, laying a, found, a, a foundation. But that doesn't give you a reason not to try to do something creative or different, or at least to try not to repeat previous mistakes. Uh, but not talking about anti-Semitism is one of the problems. Uh, I'm I'm sure. Sure. It's so nice to see you again. Well, I guess my question based on your, your statement to go on is the United States and Israel. I would have to say, without much more knowledge than reading the paper, has the best intel in the world. And how did both countries miss it? How did both countries miss it? That's why I shared the story about um, Jake Sullivan's article in Foreign Affairs. Whoops, because things are really quieting down in the region. Time to move forward with the next phase of the Abraham Accords. And on uh, number seven. And they, they gave them the right to rewrite it, but the damage was done. Um, I suspect the uh, after action report, you know, of course, there will be an inquest afterwards. It will have threads of we wanted to pay attention to different things. You know, uh, say, uh, Israel's already acknowledged a lot of troops were deployed away from Gaza to the West Bank because that's where the action was happening. Um, they wanted to believe that uh, Hamas could be bought off, and Hamas basically played into that desire. Hamas was literally sending the signals back that, um, you know, we're, we're basically done with the armed struggle for a while. We saw this same thing happen in Northern Ireland. Uh, Hamas, how could Hamas keep it so quiet, though? That's, you know, with, with all, all of the surveillance all of the electron, all of it. How did nobody hear about this? Well, I would suggest that they took the Irish case, which was you don't put anything in writing. There's no email. There's no phones. We will use human couriers to communicate, and everything will be tightly controlled in small cells. Only a few people will know what's going on. But it only works if the target of all that activity wants to believe that Hamas has quieted it. And we might be moving into one of those phases where uh, it will be, you've heard the phrase living with cancer. That, that one just makes me shudder. 
uh, and, and I have family members who are trying to live with cancer. But, you know, sort of the a response to that would be, well, aren't you looking for a treatment? Um, and, and, and often, of course, it does involve treatments, but having to live with something that's going to perhaps take your life over the long haul, why aren't you trying something different? Um, here, here, here we are. Uh, here we are doing what we need to be doing. And, you know, going through the, in, in this holding period when the military operations are taking place, having these conversations. Yes, ma'am. Um, I understand that there would be a big financial hit to the city of New York and the uh, people who lived around it. But what do you think if we got rid of the, not get rid of it, but send it to another country, the UN, let some other country host the UN? Well, the U UN is hosted in many countries. I mean, I'm big, the big meeting place. You want the, you want the General Assembly out of New York? Yeah. But, uh, it, it, that could happen. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure who would, you know, would, would you want it to be China? I don't know. I, I just think we've been spending too much money on, uh, I don't know, I, it just, I can't tell you when right now. Um, and uh, I'm not, but the UN often does things that make me go, oh, um, and yet, if you're not talking about it, uh, if, you, if, you know, if you're either grinding out your issues or you know, organizing to do something uh, illegitimate about it, at least the UN is giving us a forum where we come together face to face. Uh, it, it's, it's quite a unique, thank you, Woodrow Wilson, it's quite a unique activity. Not to tell you what you want to hear, and I think that's what happened with Israel and you know, not, not keeping their eye on the ball with Hamas and Gaza. They wanted to think that Hamas was under control, and that's, those were the signals that were constantly given. We host the UN. Uh, we drove the creation of the UN, and I can, I can give you like 15 million reasons why you don't want China to be hosting the UN because uh, of the other outreach that it's doing with the developing world. Uh, and where values that we share, like due process, rule of law, human rights, liberties, etc., don't ever come into the picture. So they are, you know, utterly at odds with the charter. Uh, 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 the, the UN is so interesting. They wrote the charter of the UN, and then they had they they did exactly what we did. We wrote uh, we wrote our Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. It's like, oh, we need to write a Bill of Rights. And the UN had to write the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is our creature. And it is our way of shaping world affairs. Uh, we host them all coming together face to face. And I can't tell you what conflicts have been ameliorated or even completely avoided, including wars, because of the work of the UN. That it gives states at least some mechanisms for resolving conflicts, for compromising some differences. Some of those seem impossible, right? Uh, Arab Israel, until they're not. That's what I said about Northern Ireland. <coughs> you know, if the conflict is indefinite, ongoing, until it's not, until people change some things. So by hosting it, um, and we pay about 20% of the UN's operating budget as its host. Uh, the Trump administration got it taken down from 24 to 22, and then 22 closer to 24. Uh, so we, we pay for a lot of it. If you're a New Yorker, you have terrible aggravation. You know, when, when the General Assembly is in town and 180 different sets of diplomats have no idea where to park, and the police are not allowed to put a boot on a car, much less tow it, because it has diplomatic immunity. Um, but we have this one place serve the international community, maybe reduce conflict, and certainly to exercise influence over them. And I wouldn't want to give that to China. Yeah. Thank you for that conversation. If you want. Let's go ahead. Hamas has been ruling in Gaza now for well over 20 years. Um, uh, why, uh, you know, they won the election. Why they they won there, one election. One election. Yeah. Why has there been no 
further elections, why has the Palestinian Authority not tried to regain control, political control of the Gaza Strip? When I figure that one out, I'll also understand what's happening in uh, the GOP dynamics right now. <laughs> <laughs> but in, 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 in fairness to a very important question, uh, there, there were two armed forces, one more based in Gaza, Hamas, and Fatah, obviously in the West Bank. So the Palestinian Authority is a creature of Fatah, and Hamas is a creature of the armed struggle in Gaza. Um, both, I would say, when I brief officers, I use the phrase badly divided, badly led, and corrupt. The resources that come in uh, go to weapons, go to salaries for people in Hamas, and uh, basically telling the rest of the people in the West Bank or Gaza, and not much else for you. It, uh, they are united by one thing, which is their opposition to Israel. And that makes it possible for them not to address all the other host of issues. Uh, which is why, if you study game theory, it would be, it's an interesting thought exercise. If there were a, a peace accord, if there was a Palestinian state being formed, I'd suggest to you, sir, that the Palestinian Authority of Hamas are at the very bottom of the list that either the United States or Israel want to see constituting a new government. So they, they need fresh leadership. Uh, Mr. Abbas from the Palestinian Authority is, is failing. He's deeply corrupt. They've cooperated to keep more peace in the West Bank than Hamas did. Remember, Israel left Gaza, right? Um, Ariel Sharon made the decision. Heck with it. You know, it's not Eretz Israel. It's not Judea, Samaria. We're done. It kind of reminds me of what, how the Romans had to handle their management of Palestine. Expulsion. That's, that's why Jews left the Holy Land, right? They were expelled by a Roman Empire that could not manage the conflict because nationalism, you know, religious identity, etc., were so strong and organ and, 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 and the resistance was so deep. But the resources that have been steered both to Hamas and, and PLO, Fatah, obviously the Palestinian Authority have been resources for arms, they've been revenue streams, et cetera. Never has there once been a component in that aid coming from Iran or Saudi Arabia that would involve building the pyramids for people. There's the cause, but that always seems to completely eradicate any consideration of actual people trying to lead their lives. The cause, and, and it's, it's completely exploited by the leadership. And there's no means to hold them to account. Yes, ma'am. Um, going back to the question of intelligence failure, do you think that um, our lack of a uh, ambassador to either Israel or Egypt contribute to that? I'm just curious. So, I, I would think not, but it certainly did not improve communication. But I, I do believe we will find that a big portion of the problem was Hamas knew how to go silent, and Israel heard what it wanted or saw what it wanted to see. Uh, the, the current government really wanted to focus on the West Bank, uh, you know, its judicial reforms, expansion of settlements, etc., uh, and they were shown what they wanted to see, and that's why you know you, you've heard of the red teams in Intel and other planets. People have to ask that, well, what if, what about? And when they left Gaza, final point, when they left Gaza, there was no human infrastructure for intel on the ground. I, uh, I heard a journalist once say, it used to be before 2005, if I was taking an assignment in Gaza, I'd ask an Israeli friend, any place I should go, you know, a place to eat, anything? And he said, oh no, but, but don't worry, we'll know exactly where you are. You know, where you're, where, where you're buying your shawarma on the street because they're human intelligence. That withdrawal, I, will, I, I would bet money, will be on the list of how the intel, what contributed to the intelligence failure. Lack of human intel, lack of signals intel. You know, they went strictly human couriers. And then they had a pretty clear plan of playing 
to Israel's desire for a quiet Gaza. I see PhD dissertations being written. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, we, we need, you need to learn from your mistakes. So it's easy to learn from your success, right? But it's, it's the mistakes where I've always had the most exquisitely painful lessons, uh, but too exquisite to repeat. Carol has the last one. Carol has the last one. And it deals with Hamas and how one deals with it. And the, what they are absorbing, as you have so eloquently well told us, they're taking all the money that, and, with, and the resources that have come in to the Palestinian people and need for themselves. I guess in my meanness, I would ask the Israeli to bring up a lot of leaflets as they told the people to get out of northern Gaza. Have leaflets saying, if you want food, fuel, um, Medicines go to Hamas, go in the tunnels and take them back. They're yours, they took them from you. And keep that up until the people themselves are set enough and need these resources because they're now going into the warehouses. I heard that this morning. The UN humanitarian warehouses are being and they tell them yeah. where these resources are and who is it sold back from. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why the, the aid workers who are there, and, and many of them are, are Americans, uh, but it's one of the reasons why Gutierrez, the UN Secretary General, was, was, was tough on this topic, because he's already lost 35 aid workers who, who died in the assault so far. So, I mean, those are his people, right? He, he's the Secretary General, they, they, he's, he's their boss. But you're right, how do people demand more from them? I mean, it's a really interesting and important question. I'd suggest to you all, it's also something Americans could be talking about right now. We should be doing better. Uh, and and we, we, we need to be doing better, if not for us, certainly for, for the next generations. Uh, unfortunately, when you have such an aggressive armed faction like Hamas, there's an old saying from Star Trek, resistance is futile. And to, to stand up against Hamas could, could often be deadly or something. But I don't think people got that far in their thinking, Carol. I think they were united in their suffering, in their misery, and in having all the blame focused in one direction. And nobody asked the question about your leadership, you know, how are you going to change the, the trajectory of this conflict? My last thought will be, there is still a chance to change the direct trajectory of this conflict. We didn't really see what could happen in the Yom Kippur War. How can it be 50 years ago? But the Camp David Accords came, peace with Egypt, a cold peace, but still a peace. 94, we got peace with Jordan. The steps are small. But um, Egyptians and Israelis were asked to accept things that were hard. It got Anwar Sadat killed. Uh, and it certainly got shot by being killed as well. It's, it, it, it's a struggle. Uh, but if people aren't talking, they're not going to be in a position to make demands of their government look better. Not more, better. I thank you so much for your attention this morning. My thoughts and prayers are, are, are going to be on this topic uninterrupted, I can guarantee you. Take good care, everyone. Thank you. Well, let me not. <laughs> 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 <laughs>